Amen. And thanks to all of you for being here today. You know what? None, none of those people sitting in front of you or behind you or beside you had to be here. They were not paid to come, although sometimes that might not be a bad idea. Just pay them to come and get them saved and see what God will do. I've heard of things like that happening. But they're here because they love God more than themselves and love others more than themselves. And that's why we should come to the house of the Lord. I, I don't like it when I hear immature Christians say, well, I didn't really get anything out of it. You know that's just perfectly fine for you not to get anything out of it as long as he gets what he needs and those around you get what they need. You'll get your return. It might not feel like you thought or be what you were looking for, but just keep on being faithful and it'll come. He will, God will not let anyone give that he does not pour seed back into. Amen? So thank you for doing that. Thank you for your obedience. And I'm going to share today on Pentecost Sunday, guess what I'm going to talk about? Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And I wish I had two hours because I love this topic. It's God just has revealed so much to us and poured so much into us. And I, we get phone calls and we get uh, emails and we get comments on Facebook. We're looking for a Holy Ghost church. We're looking for a Spirit-filled church. We want to go somewhere where the Spirit is allowed to move and operate. That's a, that's a real frequent request of us and, and something that people are, are responding to and, and hungry for in this day and age and, and probably in all of time, but I think it's getting a lot more, the appetite's getting a lot more stirred and the souls are getting more thirsty. And let me say in, in a little bit of an introduction today, if you came dry in your spirit. If, if everybody's got their hands up and, and you've got yours folded, if people around you are weeping and your eyes are dry, if everyone's smiling into the song and your face and your countenance is low, don't leave dry. Amen? Don't be like those folks that died of thirst in the middle of a river. Amen? You're here today. There is a fountain flowing. There is water free to drink, and you will never thirst if you drink of him. And if you get through a dry place to a dry place or, or you're going through something that's kind of got you where you just aren't feeling it or you don't know, you're, you're confused or whatever, before you leave here today, let God fix it for you. Let him do it. Let him have his way in your heart. Somebody shout amen. amen. So we're going to talk about the, the baptism or the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And in Luke 3 and 16 is one of my favorite passages. It says, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, this is before Jesus has been even announced into his ministry. This is a prophetic voice speaking. Now, you fast forward about three and a half years, you'll come to Acts chapter 1. And verse 5 says, For John, this is Jesus' last words on planet Earth. 
I'd say that's pretty important, wouldn't you? I mean, not to put one part of Scripture above the other, but it, you, if you can't read it all, understand it all, digest it all, at least get this one, right? At least start here and then work your way in. John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And he puts another word in there, not many days hence. John didn't have that part to say, but Jesus did. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. See, they wanted to know times. How many of us would like to get, man, you could be a lot more patient if you knew when the end was coming. If I just knew when this was going to be over. Y'all pray for Dick Evans. He had surgery this week, and this update is brought to you by the river. Nonprofit organization. Dick Evans had surgery, serious surgery, and he had a three or four rough days, and he's home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Amen. But y'all really need to pray because Jeanette's job is to keep him still. <laughs> and he may or may not have the patience of Job. All right. So the disciples wanted to know, so is this the time? How many know that so many people right now in a crisis are looking for time? What's, this is the time, this, this time, in time. But how many know Jesus would look at you just like he did those disciples and he'll say, I'm not going to tell you the time. You don't need to know the time. You don't need to know the time. I sure bought a lot of books trying to figure that out. All that money I spent on that series. I sure thought I could figure it out. Man, I'm really smart, Lord. Do you know how smart I am? Do you know how much news I watch? Lord, I tell you what, I might have this thing more figured out than you think I do. What he wants you to know is that you shall receive not a time clock, but power. Yes, sir. It doesn't matter when it is. It doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter how it happens. You can study all that. It's fine. It's fun. It's, it's not bad. But what matters is that you have the power living in you <laughs> that will quicken your mortal body give you power to be a witness to see God in every circumstance to see God in whether it's evil or good sickness or health rich or poor you'll see God in it somebody say amen, amen. and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That great commission, Jesus' last words every time, it involves what Curtis said, there's a hurting world and we need to be living about them. Amen? Too many Christians have gotten caught up in the culture of self. I need my needs met. When you start saying that about your marriage... Your marriage is in deep trouble. I'm not getting my needs met. Your, your marriage is in real big trouble because you've turned, turned it around. When you start saying that about your church, your relationship and covenant with the church is about to get in trouble. Amen? Why? Because it's not about me. All this I'm doing, I've got to do it about them. Amen? Somebody say them. 
the power of God available to every believer is the only hope you have of living a sinless life. You may be a strong-willed person. You may be a very disciplined person. But the only power on earth that can deliver you and help you and empower you to live a sinless life, and by sinless, I don't mean just committing sins. I mean these sins between the two temples that we inhabit. Huh? All that stuff. The power of the Holy Ghost is the only hope you have. So I want to share that with you in a, in a, a little bit of a teaching setting here. I'm going to use charts. How many like charts? Pictures. Yeah. So uh, Jeremy, if Jeremy was teaching, he would use a chart, right? So God manifested himself in three dimensions, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. There are a lot of threes in Scripture. We could go on and on about that. I could teach a, a good sermon or a good hour teaching on three dimensions, but we, we hear in Scripture about water, spirit, word. Body, how, how we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, if you want to get somewhere, you need to ask, seek, and knock. Somebody say amen. If, you're a, if you believe on the Lord, there are three things you need to do. According to Acts 2 and 38, you need to repent. One, be baptized. Two, three, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost and fire baptism. The tabernacle which showed Moses... Uh, in great detail was in three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and the holy place, or the inner court slash holy place, and then the third part was called the holiest of holies. Only the high priest. In the Old Testament covenant, the high priest was a type and shadow of, of Jesus, okay? Not you and me, but Jesus. We have a high priest, and his name is Jesus. Amen? And he's the one that we're uh, uh, going to come into in order to experience the third dimension. The, the outer court, as you can see a little bit, I know the writing is small. Don't worry about the writing because you don't need the writing. None of it I'm going to talk about. So the outer court is this big black line around the border here. You see that? That's the outer court. And the outer court was nothing in and of itself. It was never the destination for anything except the fleshly sacrifice. That's where the flesh ended. It was put on an altar, slain, blood ran around it and from it, and the fire of God consumed it. End of the story. Okay? So the outer court dimension is where you deal with self. That's where you lay your best on the altar and say, God, I'm yours. If you ever came to Jesus and experienced salvation, you said something along the lines of, God, I'm yours. I'm all yours. I give you every part of my life. Amen? Have you ever been to a wedding and the, the groom said, I give you part of me. I give you some of what I have. Some of my earthly possessions. You've not heard that, have you? <laughs> I could see a bride uh, gathering her stuff up and hitting the road real quick. Amen? If she's got any sense, right? Um, hold on, preacher. I'll see you later. Amen? 
When you come to God, it's all or nothing. When you put that bull on that sacrifice, it wasn't a barbecue. It wasn't a cookout. Huh? Nobody said, hey, save me some of them ribs. Gone. The outer court, that's what it's all about. So when you get past that altar of sacrifice, when you throw yourself down on the ground on your knees, I don't care if you're worth $50 billion. You don't get to Jesus any other way. If any man, it's the way my Bible reads, if any man will come and follow me, he'll lay down his life, pick up his cross, and follow me. I don't care who you are. You're not getting there any other way. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> There's only one way to Jesus, and that is fully, totally repent of your sins, give up your whole life, lay it on the altar, and say, God, I'm yours. Every speck of every part of my being, every thought, every dime, every bit of energy, every ounce of life I've got left in me, every breath I'll ever breathe, it is yours. And if you're not willing to give that, you're not coming to Jesus. You can go to church. You can fit in probably to some extent most places. You can serve in church. You can have a good old time. You can feel goosebumps. Yeah, you can feel goosebumps and be lost as a goose in a hailstorm. If you think the goosebumps or tears is how you know you're saved, you need to read up. Think twice. That's a good feeling. Don't get me wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But that's not the sign of salvation. The sign of salvation is 100% belief that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he's the only way, the truth, and the life to get you there. Amen? 100%. Nothing else. All right. Thank you. You knew that. The second dimension is where we find the candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. It's where we really pour ourselves in to worship, serving, reading the Word, studying the Word, discipleship, illumination, revelation, all those things get there. Now, how do you get into the second dimension? Well, if you look, there's a circle right there in the first dimension, and you get into the holy place one way, and that's through that laver. That's where we get our word lavatory. It actually is, in this room, a galvanized horse trough. <laughs> there it is. Water baptism. That's where your sins are remitted, paid off. That's where you're washed and cleansed and you enter in. When you come up out of that water, you enter in immediately to the second dimension of God's salvation for you. And it's real simple, isn't it? But there's a third dimension that some folks seem to wrestle with. And I read for you in our communion meditation the scripture where Jesus gave up the Spirit, and when he did, the veil was torn. This is very significant, and a lot of folks miss it. But it was the, as soon as the Spirit went out of Jesus... The veil, the Bible said, was torn from the top to the bottom. The veil is right up there. You probably can't read it from your distance, but that blue line in between the larger square and that smaller top square is a veil that was thick and five layers of skins and fabrics and whatnot, and it had been carefully woven a tapestry and... A human couldn't tear it no matter what they tried to do, but the Holy Spirit could. And the Bible said it was torn from top to bottom. 
that was so that the people around would know that man didn't do it. It would have been from the bottom up. But it was torn from, the, from heavenly dimension, taken into two parts. And once it was torn, you'll never read about it. You'll never find it again. The presence and the glory of God was in that third dimension. Every priest and every person that went through the gate down here, the gate had four pillars, which is like our four Gospels. The four Gospels, the four witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are, a type and, are, are the type and shadow of that is the four pillars of the gate. That gets you in to Jesus, to get you in to understanding his presence and his power. The gate, that's the gate, but that's not the third dimension. Everything they did going through that gate was to an attempt to get to the third dimension. Everything we're about here is to get you to the third dimension. And once you get in the third dimension, where the veil has been torn, you have free access to the glory and the power of God, then there's no limit to what you can do. There is a power that you're endued with when you come into the glory and the presence of God. Your face shines. Something happens in you. You want to serve. You want to give. You want to pour out. As Curtis said, you, you're taking all this in. And as long as you're in the second dimension, you can just keep eating showbread till you get fat. As long as you stay in the second dimension, you can just keep lighting candles and pouring more oil in it. But in this new covenant, it's a different day. You don't have to pour oil in the lamp anymore because it's tied in to two trees whose branches provide the oil day and night, 24-7. We can live in the glory of God. We don't have to carry a bull up there to an altar anymore. We can walk down the aisle and pour ourselves out before him and say, God, here I am. I surrender all. And you can pass through the veil because the veil has been torn. And I'm just going to say this for anybody out there. Stop making veils. Stop putting things up and trying to hinder people from getting to the glory. Man cannot decide the rules and regulations of whether or not you're, can, you can have access to the glory. Now, they can dig through Scripture and find, make up things, and tell you if you do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that, you can't get into the glory. But I'm here to tell you the veil has been torn and folks that keep trying to sew it back together are in trouble with someone greater than us. Amen? Moses came from the mountain with such a glow on his face that he had to put on a mask to keep from killing people with the brightness of his countenance. They, could, they would have all been blind or struck dead or something because he was glowing so brightly. And the Bible said the glory he got was a fading glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But the glory we are receiving, he said, it's an ever-increasing glory. That might be why they want to put masks on y'all. Look at somebody and say, come on and shine. Thank you, Jesus. So what happens when you come into the third dimension? We talk about repentance where you just tell God, I'm sorry for all of it. You know, I blew it. I'm, I'm a mess. I'm a dirty, low-down, low rotten scum. That's every testimony. You say, oh, I was a pretty good guy. No, you wasn't. You're just kidding yourself. Your mama told you you was a pretty good guy. But on the Lamb's Book of Life, you wasn't in there. And you know what he says to people that aren't in there? Depart from me, I never knew you. 
you workers of iniquity. Amen? I don't like testimonies that start out with, oh, I was, I, was a, I was always raised in church. I was always a good guy. Come on. Quit grading yourself on a curve. You're a sinner. Your heart is black. You're as capable of the most vile sins uh, that happen on planet Earth as anybody else. You know those people that killed 19 people and, and ate them? The neighbor said, oh, he's such a nice guy. Pretty good guy. You know why they did that? Because sin gets in your heart. Amen? You can't judge like that. We're all sinned and short of the glory. Amen? You might not have ever beat anybody up. Might not have ever stolen anybody's car. But you still need Jesus. And you can repent of your sin. You can be water baptized. This is a willing church. We'll fill that thing up in 10 or 15 minutes. You can be water baptized and enter into that second dimension of God full and free. And then the, the beauty of that is there is no veil. <laughs> so once you're in the second dimension, guess what? Whoa, wait a minute. You're already being hurled into the third dimension. All you got to do is just yield to it. Just go with it. I'm here. Let's do it. Woohoo! Hallelujah. So what happens when you yield to that? Well, in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire. Everybody say fire. And sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, man, are you kidding? This is wow. This is fun. This is awesome. Hallelujah. I want everybody in this room that has ever received the Pentecost experience of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues to stand. You have received the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If you haven't, just remain seated. It's okay. It doesn't make you any less than anything else. It just, you're, you're on the way. You're on the journey. You're getting ready. Amen? You're getting ready. Now, I do this for a very powerful reason. Those of you that are still seated, the Holy Ghost is promised to you. If you've repented and you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, you have a promise according to Acts 2 and 38 and 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. I want you to say, I am an all. All means me. Okay, y'all can be seated now. Do you know God keeps his promise? So if he promised it to you, wouldn't it be a good idea to go ahead and receive that promise? Amen? How many of you who have not received that promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost would just like to raise your hand and say, I'd, I'd like to receive that promise today. Just hold them up high. One, two, three, four. Five, six, I'd like to receive that promise today. How many of you who have received the baptism in the Holy Ghost before, but you'd like to have a renewing in you, you'd like to see it stirred up again and have it poured out one more time, raise your hand. All right, all of you that raised your hands, come on up here to the front, and all of my